This video is brought to you by Raycon Everyday Earbuds. Stick around to hear more about them and also a special offer they're making available through my channel. Ugh, another early access survival game. Don't see 12 of those get released every day. Okay, fair enough. Your cynicism here is warranted. This is a genre that has become a little too ubiquitous over the past decade. Most of them well and truly taking the piss with that whole early access label. Some of them are like, dude, this isn't early access. This is like pre-alpha. Come on now. How are you charging for this? So I get it. But allow me to both quell your cynicism and pique your interest with one word. Vampires. V Rising is a vampire themed survival game. It is the same harvest, refine, craft and build loop you've seen in countless other survival games, except this time you're a motherfucking vampire and it totally rules. True story, I started playing this game three days ago during the pre-release closed testing window. And in that time, I've put just over 20 hours into it. And I had to do IRL stuff during those three days. Otherwise, I would have dumped a hell of a lot more time into it. I've had such a blast with this, absolutely loved almost every second of it, and just found myself so pumped for both the early access release, which kicks off later today, as well as the 1.0 release whenever that eventually happens. Let me put it this way, I've not had this much fun with a survival game since Valheim last year. I don't play that many survival games, but I do dabble in them and often find myself bouncing off them pretty fast because they're either too janky or too grindy or the combat sucks or whatever. There's a lot of issues with the survival genre. V Rising has grabbed me in the same way that Valheim did, or Subnautica before that. It finds that right mix of exploration, discovery, grind, crafting, base building, and combat to deliver something that feels deep, demanding, and hardcore without ever feeling overly grindy, punishing, or convoluted. Now, all of that could change later, mind you, as this is early access and I'm only 20 hours deep into a build that I suspect has at least 50 hours of content, but so far, so, so good. Critically, even in this pre-early access window, V Rising delivers two things that I've never seen from an early access survival game. Polish and awesome combat. I'll say right now that there's never been a more polished early access survival game on day one of its early access period. This game feels so seamless and is stuffed with intricate systems and quality of life features that other games would have delivered far, far later in their development timelines. And the combat, man, I certainly haven't played a survival game with better combat. I'm not saying that doesn't exist because I haven't played all survival games, but yeah, this combat is really superb, both in terms of player weapons and abilities and in terms of enemy design, particularly the bosses, of which there are already more than 30 and they're all excellent. Okay, so that's a lot of praise. Maybe I should just start at the beginning, give you an overview of how all of this works, and I can take you through why all of this works as well as it does. V Rising begins here, where you can select the sort of PvE or PvP experience you'd like to have. The game is server-based and the developer Stunlock Studios are making a whole bunch of dedicated servers available, but you can also spin up your own servers if you'd like, which is also awesome. You can also just run a local server on your own machine, so that's fine. In terms of play styles, there's essentially three. The first is PvE, where players cannot attack or damage each other, where they cannot loot each other's corpses and where they cannot damage any enemy structure. The second mode is PvP, where you can attack and be attacked by other players, you can loot other players' corpses and steal any materials they've gathered, and you can damage their castles, so you can loot what's inside, but you can't destroy the castle completely. The final game mode is Merciless PvP. The biggest differences here are that you can loot everything from another player, including their crafted weapons and armor, and you can completely demolish enemy bases. I will say right now that I've not yet done any PvP. I was playing on a PvP server, but I was just keeping my head down and grinding out my gear, my castle, etc. Having said that, I am very pumped to eventually do some PvP because the combat framework here is so solid that I think PvP would be awesome. Unsurprising, given that this game comes from developer Stunlock Studios, makers of Battle Right. There's a lot of discussion about why that game ended up the way that it did, but one thing that everyone agrees on is that the combat was excellent. It's excellent here too. So yeah, PvP is something I'm very keen to get in on 
when the game releases later today. After you've selected your server and server type, it's time to create your vampire. You can choose from a set of preset skin colors, faces, hairdos, etc. It's simple stuff and it doesn't matter that much since the game is top down, but it's still nice. I created the closest thing to Raziel that I could, right down to the name, and I began my adventure. V Rising begins as all great vampire stories do, in a creepy coffin sitting in some dingy crypt. The Raziel of V Rising is a fallen vampire. He and his kind once ruled these lands but were cast down and now a fell moon rises, inviting them to retake their place as bloodthirsty overlords. To do that though, Raziel's gonna need to get himself some threads and some digs, and so the journey back to the throne begins with the quaint task of collecting some bones so you can fashion a weapon. This little quest chain in the top left will guide you through your fledgling state and will stay with you for some time in your vampiric journey, telling you to craft specific items or build specific structures to keep you moving through the game's progression path smoothly. This is one of those quality of life things that I mentioned earlier. A lot of other survival games kind of just dump you onto the map and wish you all the best, but V Rising has put a lot of work into user experience, so you're never going to find yourself confused about what to do in order to advance your character or your crafting trees. Immediately, V Rising feels extremely snappy and responsive, and that's me saying that, who was playing on a US server from Australia with 244 MS. Movement is handled with WASD and your mouse controls where your character is facing. Camera is controlled by holding down the right mouse button and rotating it. You can zoom in for a more immersive perspective or zoom right out for a better view of the battlefield. Your character feels great to control. They have a dash on the space bar that will phase them forward for even more mobility. Your attacks, be they melee or with a weapon, are based on a three hit combo. So you immediately start falling into a rhythm of trying to push out a full combo before dashing to safety, avoiding enemy swing timers charged attacks and AOE telegraphs. You have a ranged spell attack which has a wind up cast time and it's a skill shot requiring you to precisely target and you have a sort of parry spell that will damage and knock back any enemy who hits you while that spell is active. This is just the very beginning, by the way, and combat becomes vastly more interesting and intricate very soon. One thing I will say though, is that there's no controller support at this point and no word yet on if it's coming. So just watch this space, I guess, if you're someone that needs to play with controller. When you get outside and arrive at the forested starting zone, your first thought is, oh, this is lovely. Beautiful green trees, running water, native wildlife running around, the warm sun shining. Hey, what's that smell? Oh shit, it's my skin. I'm a vampire, I can't be in the sun. Oh my God, help me. Much like a gamer, the sun is no friend of vampires. You can survive its rays for a few seconds and as you do, an on-screen effect warns you that you're overdosing on vitamin D. Ignore the warnings and you'll start to take a heap of damage really fast. The way you avoid this charred fate is by one, traveling at night, duh, and two, if you're gonna travel during the day, then stick to the shadows. The shadows cast by trees, rocks, and structures all work fine, so traveling during the day becomes this sort of mini game where you race from shadow to shadow, hoping that you haven't misjudged the distance. Spoiler, you will absolutely misjudge the distance, or you'll stand in a shadow and open your menu only for the shadow to disappear because the sun moves really fast in this game. That's always a fun time. With a few weapons and some armor under your belt, it's time to begin building the seat of your power. The castle heart allows you to build things around it. So this isn't the sort of game where you can build multiple bases such as in Valheim, though the game does hint that you'll be able to have multiple castles later on. For now, you lay down some borders, build some walls and put down this blue torch thing, which covers an area in shadow so you don't need to worry about the sun while you don't have a roof over your base. Much like the combat, building makes an extremely good first impression. If you played any game with building, you'd know that it's typically all kinds of janky, stuff not snapping together properly, terrain blocking off stuff when it shouldn't, visual defects, the works. Not so here in V Rising. To quote the Todd, it just works. A hell of a lot better than it did in Fallout 4, in fact. The downside to that reliable functionality is that it's a lot less flexible than in many other survival games. Valheim is a great example, which allowed you to raise and lower terrain or combine very specific modular pieces of construction however you pleased. This let people build basically whatever they could imagine. It's much more limited and prescribed here in V Rising. For example, you don't build roofs. They are automatically built on top of an area once you have four walls and a floor. You also can't build multi-level structures. You sort of can if you can build up a hillside, but if you wanna build a room on top of another room, 
then no, that's not possible. So yeah, it's far less flexible than comparable offerings, but it's also far more polished and user-friendly than you've come to expect from the survival genre. Once the basics of your base are in place, you'll start to notice that you've hit a bit of a progression wall with nothing new to build or craft. This is where Stunlock begin pushing you out of the nest, forcing you to both explore the world and hunt those unfortunate enough to live within it. Exploration is one of the key mechanics and motivators within the survival genre, and I think it's actually one of V-Rising's weaker components. The world is not procedurally generated, and it's essentially a number of large zones all broken up by different topographic and geographic elements. Small forests, hills, rivers, canyons, etc. You'll spend a lot of time running from your base to a certain location, and that is rarely pleasant since the network of roads and obstacles feels quite counterintuitive. So you have to keep bringing up your map, and that's kind of hard to do during the daytime since you're also jumping between shadows and avoiding patrols, and the shadows keep moving and you're on fire all the time. It's, it's a lot. For a game that has really nailed so many quality of life features already and that feels so pleasant to play, the process of moving around this world definitely feels like an area where there's still plenty of room for improvement. More generally though, the world itself is less interesting to explore and move through than what the survival genre is typically capable of. A lot of those games exist in first person perspective and so they're much more able to achieve a sense of scale. Valheim's procedural generation and visual design managed to produce some truly awe-inspiring natural vistas that felt like they were made just for you. V Rising's top-down perspective limits that potential for scale, its static world reduces that sense of unexpected discovery, and the landmarks you do chance upon aren't particularly remarkable. I've seen a few biomes now, the start area, a frosty peak, some farmlands. You'll find wolf dens and farmsteads and bandit camps and graveyards. It all looks nice, but I never arrived at any of it and thought, whoa, this looks really cool. It all just exists as functional space to be harvested rather than artistic space to be discovered and absorbed. The thrill of wandering through unknown landscapes to chance upon some spectacular sight V Rising is all but absent that, at least so far. While we're on the topic, I'll make the point that even though the game maintains a fairly simple aesthetic, it doesn't run super well. I'm playing on an RTX 2080 Ti at 1440p. I was averaging maybe 30 to 40 FPS-ish. Uh, but I definitely noticed the frame rate would drop significantly as my base became more developed. I do wonder how the game will handle a fully built and decorated castle because right now things are already looking a little shaky. During combat though, I gotta say that it holds up really well, quite a consistent frame rate, even though it won't get near that 60 FPS threshold that most of us accept as a given at this point. This is early access and it's certainly more than playable, but there's clearly some optimization work still to be done here. Anyway, back to exploration. V Rising isn't a game where progress is made just by by chopping down a few million trees. Progress here comes from raiding nearby settlements, pillaging their stores of supplies, and sucking the life force out of their commanders. It's so fucking cool, I love it. Certain buildings or items you need to craft may contain items you can't yet make, say cloth for example. So in that instance, you'll need to go to a nearby bandit cave, kill a bunch of fools, and relieve them of their cloth. Later on, you'll be able to craft cloth, but to get to that point, you have to take a bunch of it first. That's the rhythm that V Rising forces you into, and it so neatly folds into that day-night cycle. The day is typically spent at your base, harvesting resources, crafting, building, planning, scheming. When night falls, it's raiding time, and you and your buddies strike out under cover of darkness to wreak havoc on the local populace, taking whatever blood and treasure you can get your hands on, withdrawing just before the sun rises. And that sun can really sneak up on you and totally wreck your day. So often, we've been out on some raid, and we lost track of time, and we're like halfway through killing a boss, when we hear that rooster crow, and we're like, in that moment, things immediately flip from being totally in control to being totally out of control. A moment ago, we were the hunters, but now we are the hunted, desperately seeking for the safety of the shadows as we're pursued by the same villagers who we were just about to feast on a moment ago. Like I said, I love it, it's so good. The commanders I spoke about earlier are kind of the most interesting part. Each of them unlocks some new structure or new ability or both, and the showdowns with these bosses are crazy. The first few are pretty simple, like a wolf, a frost archer, very reminiscent of Ash. Pretty easy stuff. Later on though, you're facing off against pyromaniacs and poison-wielding liches and dryads and so many more. Each of them have their own suite of abilities, their own attack patterns, telegraphs, phases. Like, each boss has new attacks that kick in at different health levels. So, I've killed like, 
around 8 of the available 37 bosses and every one of them has impressed me with how tightly designed they've been. You'll also end up killing most of the bosses multiple times since they drop some useful materials and as you return to them you'll have an easier time because you've learned their attack patterns and telegraphs. Combat in this game is extremely skill based rather than just stat based and your ability to completely overwhelm your foes comes not from your gear but more so from your knowledge of your foes weaknesses. This is probably a good time to delve a little bit deeper into the game's combat which I can say with absolute certainty is its best feature and its defining feature in the survival landscape. Most survival games typically have either no combat or very simple combat, at least from a mechanics perspective. There are of course a lot of exceptions to this depending on how you apply the survival label, but on the whole most survival games are less about deep combat systems and more about the complex ways that players use those systems, especially in PvP settings. V Rising is as much an RPG as it is a survival game because every aspect of its combat and loot systems is built to reflect the sort of depth and customization that exist in traditional RPGs. Let's take that dash I mentioned at the start for example. It's called Veil of Blood and it lets me dash a short distance making me invulnerable as I do so. Great defensive ability, right? Sure, but it also applies a very short buff that increases my next attack's damage and it also heals me for 5% of my health. So right away this goes from being a really strong defensive technique to one that I can also use offensively if I'm skilled enough to do so. That's just one of the travel abilities I can bind to my spacebar. There are five of these. Veil of Bones is another example. This one phases me for a second and if I melee something after that it creates a little like Shang Tsung fireball that ricochets up to four targets. What about Veil of Chaos? This one can be cast twice, it leaves behind a phantom of me and those phantoms will explode to deal damage in the area. So that's three of the five abilities that can be bound to my spacebar. Then there's the castable abilities. The Shadow Bolt, which I mentioned earlier, is a bit of a go-to. And I also use Chaos Volley, which fires two projectiles that each deal damage in a small area. If I'm running in a group, I'll often run Blood Rage, which shields my party members while also increasing their attack speed for a small window. If I wanted to go full support, I might even want to run Blood Aegis, which applies a shield to myself or my party members, and it knocks back all enemies nearby the target when it's applied. What if I wanted some AoE damage? Well, Corpse Explosion exists, and it does pretty much exactly what you expect it would. So that's just a few of the 24 castable abilities in the game, not to mention the ultimates which I haven't even unlocked yet. What about weapons? Okay, so the first few weapons you unlock don't have anything other than their basic attacks, but the next tier of weapons have specific attacks. So the mace for example, hitting Q does this. Fantastic gap closer, huge AoE damage and it actually snares anyone it hits. The spear does this. That is a lot of single target burst damage here, but if I recast the ability during the channel, it will do this like thrust attack, which both does bonus damage and it also pushes enemies away. The axes do this. Another great gap closer and it provides a temporary attack damage and speed buff after that. So not only do you have weapons with different animations and attack patterns and unique abilities attached to those weapons, but you also have bonus effects and mechanics built into each of those abilities, providing for such a massive skill ceiling when you finally understand how to use all of these weapons and abilities correctly. There's even a fairly lightweight gear game in the mix as well. The items I choose to wear have different set bonuses on them, like bonus health and damage. The rings I choose to wear allow me to focus on spell casting versus physical damage versus survivability. And the cloak I craft increases resistances to things like sunshine. Very helpful, by the way. To cap all of this off, there's a very innovative and very interesting blood system. So you're a vampire, which means you need Blood, surprise, surprise. Not all blood is the same though, and not all blood is made equal. When I consume blood, I take on the characteristics of whatever I've consumed. So right now I have the rogue blood, which gives me stuff like increased crit chance, movement speed, etc. But I got that from a really low level enemy, so it's just giving me tier one benefits. If I got one from a really powerful rogue enemy, I'd be getting this huge boost to my stats and that's gonna make me a hell of a lot more lethal. 
Similarly, this is me chugging down some bear blood, which gives me the creature buff, increasing my speed, my resistance to sun, my health, and my health regen. Really great all round survivability buff, but again, I'm only getting tier one benefit here since this is just a low level bear. That blood doesn't last forever, by the way. It slowly depletes with time, and I also consume it to heal myself. So I'm always on the hunt to both satiate that eternal thirst and to keep myself as buffed as I can possibly be based on the sort of build that I'm going for. So just think about how much preparation goes into something like a boss hunt or a PvP skirmish. You and your mates would all be using a mix of different weapons, different gear sets. You'd all have different abilities so you can buff or protect each other. You'd go hunting for some high level blood to make sure you're topped off. And then you'd wait for nightfall so that you can do your thing without the sun spoiling your fun. That's a lot of flexibility, customization, synergy and roleplay in a genre that typically doesn't serve up a lot of that. I really, really like what Stunlock have done here. It's a merging of RPG and survival that I don't think we've seen before, and combined with Stunlock's awesome top-down combat, I really think this is a winning combo. So important caveats to finish. This is an early access preview review thing. Uh, it is possible the game totally blows later on. It could become too grindy. The PvP could be really unbalanced. The later bosses could be repetitive, phoned in, filler, whatever. So remember to take whatever I'm saying with a grain of salt because this is early access and a lot could change both later in this build and in the future as Stunlock continues to add to it. The other thing I'll briefly touch on is the reputation of Stunlock and certainly the skepticism that exists around them given the way that Battle Right unfolded. Ah, uh, look, I'm gonna say that I've read a lot of stuff on both sides of the fence when it comes to Battle Right's demise. And some people are like, Stunlock really fucked us on this and they abandoned the game. And other people are like, oh, they made a game and they made some mistakes but we all make mistakes and hey, they moved on to the next thing because whatever. Now look, to be honest, I don't know enough about all of that because I was never close to battle right. So I can't say you shouldn't trust Stunlock, but nor am I saying, hey guys, you should totally trust them. I'm just saying, I don't know. I'm just calling it out here because I know it's going to be all over the comment section. I've seen and read both sides of the argument. I understand them. Neither of them leave me convinced that Stunlock is the devil incarnate or that they're completely blameless. It just seems like a very messy situation. I will say that in general, I'm a fan of giving people, studios, whatever, a second chance so long as there's the right intentions. So far, I'm seeing good intentions here. There's no pay to win microtransactions, just some cosmetic DLC you can buy if you want. They're doing early access first, test it and refine it. They've already had three betas. This is one of the most polished day one early access games I've ever played. A huge achievement in and of itself, but especially so in the survival genre, which is perhaps the worst abuser of that early access label. I'm seeing dedicated servers, local server options, PVE, PVP, merciless PVP. It looks really nice. It doesn't run super well, but nor is it like terrible. From a design perspective, it feels super polished with systems and quality of life features that make this feel more like a release candidate than an early access build. There's 37 bosses in there. I've killed like eight of them in 20 hours. Admittedly, I am taking things very slow, but still, that's, that's a lot of stuff. Top to bottom, almost the whole package really sings. And unless I'm missing something, I expect this will be a pretty big deal. The dudes I were playing with, they love their survival games and they couldn't get enough of it either. I think Stunlock are onto something here and I'm really looking forward to putting many more hours into it, both during early access and when it ships 1.0, whenever that is. Right now, I'm low-key obsessed with The Expanse. So much so that I've started reading the books. That's kind of a lie though, since I'm actually listening to the audiobooks, which are great by the way, and when I do that, I'm always listening to them through my Raycon wireless earbuds. I've been using Raycons for over two years now, and I've always loved them. They've always felt super comfortable, sounded great, and had awesome battery life. Generally speaking, when I leave the house, I'm like, wallet, keys, phone, Raycons. For real, they're just kind of part of my routine at this point. Pretty crazy for a set of earbuds that are like half the price of pretty much every other set of earbuds on the market today. Raycon's newest model, the Everyday Earbuds, are their best ones yet, with 32 hours of battery life, eight hours of playtime, a built-in microphone for phone calls, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more base, five different color options, and a range of custom gel tips for both comfort and to ensure a nice noise isolation.
insulating fit. One thing I really love about them is that they actually stay in my ears. I have these giant Dumbo sized ears and I found that most other earbuds will just fall out. But Raycons have a really nice shape that sits snugly, so they just never drop out. I love that. I'm not the only one who loves them, by the way. Raycons have over 50,000 five-star reviews, and best of all, Raycons come with free shipping and a 30-day return policy, so you don't have to take my word for it. Just try them for yourself, and if you aren't happy with them, you can get your money back. To get 15% off your order, visit buyraycon.com forward slash skill up, or just click the link in the description below. Thanks Raycon for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.